This time we're going to talk about a residential portal frames from an engineering perspective. This is looking at the bracing capacity of portal frames in a mainly jib braced house. So it's basically a, a simple building timber framed house and the bracing is normally provided by the jib, the plasterboard. So the contents for today, it will be mainly about the calculations as well. We'll have a brief look at the red coat template and then go in through in detail at the MATCAD example and then look at some connections and what are the site issues, potential site issues with these kind of frames. Let give you some tips and raise some issues about it and finally provide the references. Interestingly enough, uh, two, uh, one of the references is from the engineering uh, practitioners group and uh, welcome all those from the engineering practitioners group to today's seminar. So for people in Redco to find the spreadsheet, it's, it's under my templates and under analysis and you'll find steel portal BUs. If you load that up, you can find out the bracing equivalent for a steel portal frame. <clears throat> so quite often I look at a spreadsheet and wonder what the hell is a spreadsheet doing? Because the spreadsheet will hide a lot of um, information and you wonder what kind of wizardry is hiding behind those macros. So let's look at it in detail, not the Excel, but what the calculations should be. So let's open a MathCAD version of it. And this is my MathCAD version um, produced some time ago. Uh, here we're using MathCAD Prime. I know there's a MathCAD uh, Prime 9 out, but we're still on MathCAD 8 at the moment. And so some background information to the calculation. So this is presenting calculations as I'd like to present them and review them. Um, so light timber frames as designed by NZS 3604 usually have an assumed ductility of 3.5 due to the jib board bracing. Now this is quite a novelty to me because coming from England, we don't consider plasterboard to be a structural material and we certainly wouldn't consider plasterboard to be ductile. However, jib has done a very good job at persuading the New Zealand industry that jib is not only a fine structural material and it can perform in a ductile manner under seismic loading and they've done some tests to prove that. It does feel counterintuitive, especially as the second part of it says that the steel frame is not ductile, i.e. you're using a ductility of one. Well, this confused me no end. How does plasterboard get a ductility of three and a half when steel only gets a ductility of one? Now, we all know that steel is a highly ductile material and you would normally have a ductility mu factor bigger than one. However, in the case of a timber framed house, which is really what NZS 3604 is aimed at, the portal frame, the steel portal frame is not likely to go beyond its elastic limit. It's not going to go plastic, so you're not going to get ductility. You're not going to be looking towards ductility. On the other hand, how does plasterboard get a three and a half ductility? Well, it's because of your nailing or screwing your plasterboard onto a timber frame. And the ductility comes from those fixings under a seismic load or any dynamic load for that matter. When you push this uh, timber frame wall clad in uh, jib board, it will deform. And as it deforms, the metal of the fixings will start to go ductile. That's where the ductility comes from. So the design philosophy is based on the following assumptions. You have an ultimate deflection of your frame and it's limited to 1% of the story height. So height over 100 for wind and seismic at ultimate limit state. You then limit the serviceability limit state deflections to height over 300. And there we have our mu factors of three and a half and one for jib board and the portal frame respectively. So 
Mass CAD allows you to define units, and so Jib has defined the unit of a BU. What on earth is a BU? It's a bracing unit. Well, it's simply 1 20th of a kilonewton. Why or why didn't they just use newtons? So coming into the analysis, here is a typical portal frame that we use in a, a house. We have a rafter span. In this case, it's a flat rafter. Length 6.2 metres, height 2.7 metres. We've done some calculations separately to find out what the capacity of this frame is. So here is our designed bending capacity for the column and the rafter. We've also picked up what the, the I values are for the rafter and column. So I'm scrolling now. These coefficients come from uh, Klein Logal, the Klein Logal tables. So we start with a notional one kilonewton point load at eaves and apply that like so. Given that one kilonewton point load, you derive an eaves moment MB and a support reaction. So oddly enough, the, both eaves moments are the same but handed as you can tell from the bending moment diagram. So going down there, <clears throat> the horizontal load limit based on the bending capacity is then derived by factoring up the capacity versus the notional load. And we get a load of 32 kilonewtons. Based on the capacity of the rafter, 29 kilonewtons. We also get a limitation of 27 millimetres for the ULS state based on our notional deflection for a, a one kilonewton point load, factoring that up again. So factor that through, the horizontal loads for the deflection limits are based, come down to 17.29 and 5.72 respectively at ULS and SLS. So that's the first portion of, of the calculation. That's deriving it from the actual capacity of the steel frame. Now we want to look at wind as applied to our frame. Well, we've done a separate calculation, which is the earlier pages of that spreadsheet, as to what the wind pressure is on our building. We then work out the ratio between ULS and SLS, and here we go, 1.474. We factor that up to give us an equivalent load at that ULS. And so the bracing capacity in the wind is simply the minimum of these various calculations, which give us 17.2. Now, one nice thing about MathCAD is it allows you to play around with the units. So if I change that to a BU, it will work it out again in BUs. And the simple calculator that JIB provided with the JIB Easy Brace wants you to put in their custom uh, BUs as BUs per meter. Then you tell you, then you need to tell it how many meters of that portal frame you've got. So that's our wind coming to the earthquake. We calculated the elastic hazard spectrum at both SLS and ULS from a different calculation. Again, it's a different part of the spreadsheet. We've assumed a period of 0.4. And here's our ductility for the portal frame and the chip bracing. From that, we get our seismic uh, performance factors. 0.9 and 0.7 respectively. We then get our inelastic spectrum scaling factors for the portal frame and the jib bracing. So that comes down to there. And from that, we then get our elastic uh, bracing capacity in uh, earthquake mode. So it starts with <clears throat> the minimum of the calculations you've done above, plus the service at 300. So it's a height over 300 limit versus the height over 100 limit at ultimate. Uh, that gives you the capacity 
factored with scaling factors above gives you this large number as 500. However, we need to compare that with the natural ratios that we've got um, and we convert those into a, a BU figure of 158 by using this K factor as well. Now the damping reduction factor, okay, you use this with caution and the CSOC journal volume 34 actually gives you a value of 0.7. However, there are limitations on when that can be applied. Um, if in doubt, just leave it as one. But obviously that's going to reduce your BUs from that. And again, we pop out with a BU factor uh, as BUs per meter. Now, a quick check looking at Brown's report, SR 337. That's the one by Angela Liu. And there's a formula in there to compare the damping that you get in a jib framed house and comparing what you're assuming to 1170 part five. Now, normally we're looking at damping levels of about 5%, whereas the jib framed house is looking at damping around 20%. That's quite a lot of damping. And to put that in perspective, you end up with a steel portal damping factor of 1.73, which then adjusts, let's see, spell it correctly, adjusts our potential BUs uh, to 195 BUs. However, that is bigger than we've already calculated, so you take the minimum. So the final EQ bracing units for the portal frame are 158 for seismic and 117 for wind. You'll notice it seems to be stronger for wind than it does for earthquake, which usually isn't a problem because it's usually the wind load that's dominating these light timber framed houses and similar buildings rather than earthquakes. And there's the list of references. Coming back to the slideshow, that was the MathCAD. So some issues around connections. Um, this is advice that comes from, originally from Charles Clifton, but it's published in the guidance document from the Engineering uh, Practitioners Group, EGP. And one of the tips is don't use diagonal stiffeners. When you're designing portal frames, some people come up with all sorts of fancy stiffeners on the portal frames, for example, or even S-shaped frames. So don't do that. <laughs> Just use rectilinear portal frames. You're basically boxing out that corner and the whole thing is fully welded. There's some issues on site. Um, you're often limited for space and you can be parking these steel portal frames on the edge of your concrete slab. Now, if you do that with the toes out, your spacing is uh, too small for the concrete. So turn the frame around and put the toes to away from the concrete edge. And don't forget <coughs> to tighten the bolts. So edge spacing, um, what demonstrated here uh, as well. So avoid welding the whole thing on site, but if you must do welding on site, avoid welding the site knees. Um, what they suggest is design a bolted welded beam splice connection at the points of contraflector of the beam. And don't forget to be aware of potential fire when welding close to timber, because by the time you come to weld it, there'll be till timber elements in your structure as well. So if you can avoid doing site welding, all the better. Um, better still just to bolt at the points of contraflection as well. So tips. So the domestic size uh, portal frame is usually span over 20, so the depth of your sections is the 20th of the span of the frame. Uh, we did a check on the strength of the portal frame, but usually these frames are determined by deflection and deflection will govern as well. Don't forget to restrain your frame against buckling. So in plane, it's nice and stiff, but out of plane, it has very little stiffness. 
they need to be tied into another structure. Don't forget to brace the portal column as well. Don't use diagonal stiffness as I mentioned before. Use the rectilinear stiffness. So the issues. Well, this comes back to uh, the original report, uh, the brands report. So there's a fair amount of assumptions made uh, for these uh, timber framed houses when using NZS 3604. And remember that code is aimed at light timber framed buildings and they're supposed to have some kind of egg crate style. So lots of walls uh, relatively closely spaced. So it's reasonably regular both in plan and in elevation. However, Architects like to push the boundaries of this code. They like to uh, uh, put in large openings for rent sliders. And so you end up with taking out what potentially could have been good racing lines. So coming back to the brands report, she's saying there's very little verification work to justify the uh, insignificance of the irregularity because a lot of these buildings designed to 3604 and not as regular as they assumed. They've also assumed what they call viscous hysteretic damping and a damping available of 20%. That's a lot of damping and then damping normally relies on secondary structures, things that you won't take into account. Uh, in your structural design, but are relying on to give you the damping of that uh, seismic force. So they have potential to deflect well beyond their code specified deflection limit of 2.5% of the story drift at ULS. And it's like a crumple zone. So you've designed your framed house to withstand the earthquake to such an extent that it won't collapse. However, there will be significant damage. And this was the issue that came up after Christchurch. Although the houses didn't fall down, many of them were written off anyway because of the amount of damage to the walls and the plasterboard. But think about it, the plasterboard is relatively easy to replace. Once it's, it's clad, the steel frame is not so easy to replace. And the brand's document argues that the seismic bracing principles underlying 3604 may have underestimated the seismic bracing demand. However, 3604 also ignores coupling of short walls. So potentially the longer walls are much stiffer than the short walls and a series of short walls are just added together. Whereas if you've got, for example, a doorway, you will have a coupling effect between the two walls if you've got a decent uh, header or spandrel over that door. So the references, a reminder of the references, this is again from the Engineering General Practitioners Group dated 2020, and it's simply called a Residential Portal Frames and Engineers Perspective. And it outlines some of the things, and I've borrowed quite heavily from it for this presentation. The study report by Angela Liu is uh, SR337. Both of those documents uh, are worth a good look at as well. And that's the end of the presentation. The next seminar will be on uh, driven piles using the Highly formula. That's another one of what does this spreadsheet actually do? And it's looking at one of ours as well with two variations.